I'm sure you guys know that an incredibly important factor in our health is our home. Just think about how much time we spend in our homes, living, working, hosting, sleeping, and how the condition of that home can play a huge role in our ability to heal and thrive. Our home quite literally has its own microbiome, just like any other environment. And that microbiome and ecosystem in which we reside has a massive influence on our microbiome. So I wanted to bring on a guest that could come on and not scare us about mold, right? <laughs> We're not trying to make anyone feel like they need to up and make some big changes and do an expensive move and feel unsafe in their homes. But instead, today's guest is actually teaching us little bits and pieces we can do here and there for mold prevention and for actually getting to know your home and its quirks and some of the areas where it may be more prone to leaks or damage so that you can be in relationship <laughs> Coming back to the season theme, you can be in relationship with your home and actually understand how to care for it, like the temple that it is, just like you care for your body. In this episode, I'm speaking to Christine Simabu, a licensed general contractor and founder of Holistic Homes, who takes a true holistic approach to construction. She gave us so many tangible and actionable tips that felt simple and understandable. And this episode is just for anyone who wants to get a better picture of how to positively influence their health by taking care of their home in a bit more of a holistic way. We're gonna talk about the issue of mold in homes, why it grows, how to find it, what to do, and the importance of just maintaining a mold-free home through simple regular checkups long after it's gone. We're gonna actually chat about why new construction homes can be more prone to mold and how other issues due to the very fast construction that we're seeing and the air tightness of energy efficient homes can actually cause some issues with moisture being trapped or even with indoor air quality and simple strategies you can do to mitigate that. Even things like keeping your windows open more often throughout the year and becoming aware when your home is very airtight and what that can do to air quality. Christine provides super practical advice on really cheap things that you can do to just monitor humidity and moisture in different parts of your home, as well as how to do a bit of an investigation on heavy rain days, not only of the interior of your home, but the exterior of your home to again, see any areas that might be a little bit more prone to imbalance. She shares that one important thing you can do is simply know where your home's drain lines are so that you can actually watch for issues on rainy days and know where you should be checking. Even just having that information, looking at a plan of your plumbing and drain lines can make you so much more of an informed homeowner or tenant. We're gonna talk about basements and why unfinished basements are actually a better option so you don't have to spend all that money on a basement renovation because unfinished basements actually allow the walls to breathe and this prevents moisture buildup, so it's a great thing. And she'll share easy things that you can do for your appliances, especially appliances that utilize water like your dishwasher or your refrigerator, such as putting drain pans underneath them to just catch any leaks before they hit the floor and can create moisture on the floor. Just really simple things that you can do and just add into your home to create an extra layer. We're also going to talk about lighting. This is very important because in recent years, we switched from incandescent to, again, energy efficient LEDs. And in our quest to become more technologically advanced and energy efficient, sometimes we're doing things that are less natural to our nervous systems and our circadian rhythm. So we're going to talk about LED lighting, circadian rhythm, nervous system health, and how you want to opt for flicker free LED lights if you can, and just be mindful of that blue light in your home. She'll also talk about how to maintain central heating and cooling systems because these can be areas where molds can kind of linger. And she'll talk about the key to renovating old homes with healthy materials. So just a really high level guide and things that you may never have thought about for your home before. I was so enlightened by this episode. I left feeling so intrigued and also empowered. And I've had folks that I've chatted with before about mold and stuff like this, where I left feeling scared. And that was just not the case for this conversation. She kept it so high level, so casual, was just like, yeah, cool. If this is what you can do, this is what you can do. And it's going to make a huge difference. So I'm really happy to have on someone who can give us this kind of knowledge and these tools, because it's not something that we talk about often. And I 
think it's part of this big picture of our health. So I hope you love this episode. As always, like I mentioned, every episode, we're not doing any external ads and sponsors. So if you ever want to support the show, you can just go right over to organicolivia.com and shop one of my very own herbalist formulated tinctures, capsules, syrups for your family's health and for your health. We have everything from immune formulas to digestion to nervous system health and anxiety, and there's something for everyone. So thank you for listening and for supporting the show and for being part of this. Welcome to the show. How are you going to grow if you don't know where you're growing from? Whoa. This is the scientific proof of grace. That's wild. What is healthy to you? I just moved toward liberation. Let's get juicy. Welcome to the studio, Christine. Thank you. It's so nice to have you. This is a topic that we've never talked about before on What's the Juice. Mm. You are a licensed general contractor who has a completely holistic edge and approach, which I've never even heard of. (laughs) <laughs> really? I mean, I live in Yonkers, New York, in Westchester, the suburbs. You just have a few general contractors and companies that you see all around, and none of them are thinking about the things that you're thinking of necessarily. Mm. Yeah, we got to change that, right? We <laughs> yeah. need healthier buildings everywhere. It's just such a problem. And you don't have to have a holistic contractor, building science specialist to have a healthy home, but it does take a lot of onus and ownership on our part to set expectations and demand better Mm -hmm. for our homes because so many people are just feeling sick in their homes. And and I'm on a mission to change that. So how did you get into this? Did you start off as a regular licensed general contractor and then you started to see that people were getting sick in their homes or what's your story? Over 10 years ago, I bought my very first home and it was going to be an investment property and we were going to go in and renovate it and make it this great rental. And I had a real estate agent, had the home inspected, and there was like a little bit of mold found under the kitchen sink. And I was like, all right, well, go ahead and have that fixed and everything will be fine. Well, turns out when we went to go and completely demolish the kitchen, floor to ceiling, every wall in the kitchen was covered in pink and black mold. Where you could visibly see it. Not visible unless we completely took the kitchen apart. Oh, so it wasn't like you were seeing mold come up in your, I've seen mold like in toilet bowl water before. Like if you just, Mm. if it's stagnant for too long or I've seen mold actually come up on a ceiling, but you're saying that it doesn't have to even come up on a ceiling. It's not always visible. That's the toughest part Mm -hmm. is that sometimes something can be going on behind a wall and mold doesn't have to be like fuzzy and green growing on your drywall for it to be present in your home. And that experience really led me into this journey of, okay, I'm not the only one. The real estate agent wasn't knowledgeable in how how to help the situation. Everyone was pretty hands off, just like, I, it's not me. I didn't do it. And so I was really just like, oh my gosh, this is a really terrible feeling now being a homeowner and having this home that's like really going to make me sick. So going through that process really opened my eyes. I've always been in construction and then kind of paired with my passion for wellness. It was like the perfect marrying of being on a mission to like create healthier homes. What is a healthy home? What makes our homes healthy? What makes our homes, quote, ill? And is that just water damage? I'm sure it's so many other things. But yeah, um, what does that mean? And how does it affect our health? What is a healthy home is going to mean something so different to you, to me, to that contractor who's building the home. So if you go to your contractor, I want a healthy home. I want you to build me a healthy home. His definition of that's going to look so different. And I think that healthy homes work off of like a hierarchy. What's your priority? For somebody who has mold toxicity, that's probably their priority is having a home that's free of water damage. Maybe somebody is super sensitive to EMFs. That's going to be their number one. They may say, you know, I'm not super sensitive to mold, but if I'm too close to X, Y, and Z, you know, these devices really set me off. Wow. So a healthy home is not a perfect home. It's not. Yeah. I love Because we're not going to have a perfect home. Yeah. We're not going to have a sterile home. We are living with building materials in our home. And so really writing down almost like what is a healthy home to you? 
not what's portrayed and on social media. It's what's going to allow your body to thrive because you want to come home and not feel overstimulated or have coughing fits in your home or wake up puffy and swollen. Like you need to have a healthy home for you, for you and for your family. And that's going to look different for everybody. And we cannot do it all. We cannot have everything on the list of what makes a healthy home for us. So start with the priority. When you say through the list, right, there's this list that you're starting here. Can you sort of give us all of these different root causes, quote, of illness in the home so that we can even begin to decide which one is most important to us? Yeah. So talking about like what makes up a sick home, Mm -hmm. it's oftentimes kind of this trifecta of having water damage, having high EMF exposure, maybe that home is located really close to a tower. Mm -hmm. Or if we're in an apartment situation and we have all of these Wi-Fi routers next to us. And sometimes people can be really sensitive to LED lighting. Let's talk about that. Right. That's uh, that's something that kind of came along as building codes evolved and energy efficiency. Right. This big push. Um, That's a good example of when building codes aren't always looking out for our best interest in health. Mm -hmm. They're great for our energy bill. But that LED that you're getting at the hardware store is going to have a rapid flicker right naked to our eye. And can make us or even our children feel really overstimulated and hard to focus, get headaches. And they're all throughout schools now. Why is that rapid flicker an issue? So you're saying that even though a light looks like it's continuously on when it's LED, unseen to the naked eye, but seen to the cellular eye of the body, there's a flicker happening? There is. Why? There is. It's if you were to take and if you wanted to test yours at home to see what was going on, you could take your cell phone, put it on slow-mo and record your light. Just put it up and then play it back in slow-mo. And you will, most cases, see this flicker happening in your light. And that's the way that those lights function is that they have this rapid flicker Mm -hmm. and it's just really overstimulating to our bodies. And unfortunately, a lot of incandescents are just being outlawed and really difficult to get. They are. I love incandescent lighting. And here's the problem. I was just talking to my architect about this because she's like, oh, we're going to do all the lighting, blah, blah. And my husband and I were like, we don't want LED. Okay. And she's like, no, but they have these. Because I said for my circadian rhythm, that's what I had said. And she said, no, but they have these LEDs now that are, you know, at a lower wattage or whatever it's called. And they mimic sunset or sunlight and they're not as harsh as the bright LEDs. So it's fine. That's good for your circadian rhythm. And I was trying to explain that I wanted incandescent instead. And she was like, well, no, you can't really wire a home like that nowadays anymore. You can't really find them as often. And she was really just pushing for these LEDs that were a tone that perhaps my circadian rhythm would like, but were not actually going to not flicker. Mm. So I actually need to push back against her and be like, no, this is what I want. But how do we do that when incandescents are being outlawed? And why are incandescent lights better? So here's the thing. Building codes will not allow you to put incandescents in. Oh, no. In most cases, you won't pass inspection with incandescents. And here in California, that's that's a thing. Um, So no incandescents in kitchens or bathrooms, and they must be on timers. So incandescents do use a ton of energy, but they, if you get a full spectrum incandescent bulb, it it's most closely mimics the sun when you have full full spectrum. You're going to be replacing bulbs a lot. They don't last as long as as LEDs, but they don't have this rapid flicker. So they just have this nice, warm, soft light. So, yeah, there's a lot of LEDs out there that are warm warm tone, but are they really? They're giving us a ton of blue light. Yeah. Uh, They dim terribly. Like uh, sometimes if you dim them. Yeah, you dim it all the way down and then just turns off. (laughs) Yeah. So they're not great dimmers. So if we can, there are flicker-free LEDs. There are some that 
can have no blue light settings. There are some that are heading towards that direction, which might be a good fit for somebody like you who's going through a renovation, who's going to have to have an inspector come in and sign off on things. That may be a good solution. But to kind of marry the two together, what, what I like to do is in your decorative light fixtures, your vanity light, your, mm-hmm. your lamps, those are where you can put those incandescent bulbs beautiful so only turn on the led try to get a flicker free led yeah but also only turn on those brighter led lights if you really need them yeah especially in the evening so that's a good like way to marry the two is your overhead lighting okay we'll do some some really good flicker free leds but in the evening just turn those off maybe you have lamps that just have the red incandescence Mm. maybe your bedroom has red incandescence and then we kind of turn off all of the blue light in our home. So lamps and sconces and decorative light fixtures, those can be a a great place to really shut off that blue light. That leaves some room to buy some like fun vintage lamp, some fun accessory lighting, and to sort of add these details and this decor to your home through the more eye-level decorative light that adds a little pizzazz and has the right light bulb. So I kind of love that from an interior design standpoint. And it just makes me think about how in this race for efficiency and this obsession that we have as a country with, quote, efficiency, with, quote, profit and, you know, lowering expense and money in mind, it drives us further and further away from nature. And while, yes, incandescence might cost a bit more energy-wise, the real solution would be not to consume more light and try to make it more efficient, but to just turn on those lights less often. Why are we thinking that we need to have light on all the time? We, ha- we sort of have to get in touch with our circadian rhythm, period, in our lives to also have a healthy home. A hundred percent agree. And some of the best things we can do in the evening is go back to having dinner by candlelight. I love that. Like just not having any lighting on, like kind of having that as a routine. Candlelight is is great, especially while eating and winding down for for the night. So let's go back to the mold piece for a second. I think that when I go towards the mold conversation, I get a little nervous because it, it's so ubiquitous and I think it can freak a lot of people out because chances are your home could have mold. And so I think people are like, oh my gosh, I can't win anywhere. I'm trying to eat better. I'm trying to filter my water. And you're telling me my home, which I really can't do anything about at the moment, right? Not everyone has the funds to renovate or move or whatever it is. It can feel a little bit disempowering. However, obviously you're going to give us the solutions. You're going to give us the right testing to go through and maybe baby steps that we can take to remediate. And so we'll get there. But I want to ask first why so many buildings and structures are prone to mold. Well, first, I want to make sure nobody feels the stress around what's going on in my home, what's living behind my walls, because sometimes that can be more damaging than the actual environment. And we're not trying to live in a sterile environment, but being aware, like if there is a slow leak behind your wall, you should be aware of that and like get to the root cause. So having fear around living in mold isn't going to benefit any of us, but having homeowners or renters even taking on that stance of like wanting to know about their home. How can I maintain this? Where are the plumbing lines? Where are the drain lines? Like that's just a piece of it is if you can maintain your home, you can have a healthy home. So on the topic of like, what can we do within our homes um, is awareness, like maintenance, how we maintain our cars better than than our homes and it's a really big investment so we we really need to take ownership and maintain our homes properly for them to function and not have these slow leaks that lead to mold and other issues so would you say that slow leaks are the number one contributor because they're sort of hidden and you don't always see them or notice them and because of the nature of leaks and water and the way that mold grows if you can stop a leak within 24 to 48 hours you can stop the mold growth right but if it's above that time mold can begin to fester yeah i wouldn't say it's really like a time period it's more so if something is continually getting wet and then wet and dry and we're not getting to the root cause like something can get wet and we can dry it out and it should be fine 
But if we're not addressing this root cause, maybe it's condensation and it's not a leak. That's when things can happen over time. It's really like buildings 100 years ago were not like what they are today. We were not putting wicker baskets and <laughs> and wallpaper in our bathrooms 100 years ago. Even today, Europe doesn't do that, right? If you go to Europe, or parts of Mexico, their bathrooms are wet rooms. Like there's no shower glass in these like beautiful little decor pieces. You're getting that whole thing wet, right? The vanity is made out of stone. It doesn't have this like storage underneath, right? You have these plaster walls. It's like a wet room because it's a high humid area. But here we are really wanting to focus on aesthetics and have this beautiful home with penny round floor tiles and wallpaper in our bathroom. Like that's just not functional for a healthy bathroom. So yeah, if we could get back to focusing on function first and how that space is going to perform long term, then I think we could really reduce the amount of issues that we're having. In my case, I'm currently I'm about to renovate my home. And so because I'm going to have a chance to renovate, I'm going to have a chance to change the two main bathrooms. And now I will work with my architect and make sure that they're going to be wet rooms. Beautiful. But a lot of people obviously are not able to either renovate or build something from scratch. So I'd love to hear perhaps your advice in this vein for those who are in a conventionally built home, especially the new homes that we're seeing where they're put up in six to seven months. Yes, that's the thing. A hundred years ago, I go back to that, but that's like when homes were built the best 50 years ago or so. Mm -hmm. That lumber is so dense. Like you need a chainsaw to demo a hundred year old home sometimes. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, it's, it's not forest grown trees. It's farm grown trees that we're using for lumber and they're just soft and porous and because they're new. Right. And they're grown so fast. Oh, no. Like we're... <laughs> It's a, it's a supply thing. Like we need more lumber. So they're just growing this subpar lumber for our homes and they're going up in six to seven months, whereas it used to take 12 to 24 months to build a home. So when you're building a home and this goes to new construction, especially in like a track home development, and you see those things go up in six to seven months, there's so much moisture involved in home building, right? That slab, that foundation has so much moisture, the drywall, the mud, the paint, like all of this is going into our home and energy efficiency standards now require it to be so airtight. Yes. Where's all that moisture going to go? Yes. And, and it's in our home and we have this airtight home. And so it's, it's now our air quality inside our home. I hate to say this, but that's really some of the biggest issues I see are new construction homes because they're going up so fast. Why is the airtight thing an issue? Because a lot of people are doing it because of the cost of heating and cooling and to keep their costs down. Right now I'm in a smart home Airbnb situation. <laughs> and because it's chilly at night, I like to have the heat on, but also a window open so it doesn't get too cold. That's kind of how I function at my house because it's not energy efficient. And because it's a smart home, a voice comes on and it's like, a window is open. The heat will now turn off. Mm. And so I have to, if I want to stay warm, I have to keep everything airtight and I feel like I'm going to explode. So why is that an issue? We need fresh air. Airtight homes can be really great. Like in certain climate zones, they can be really great if they're done really well. But a lot of them are not done. Uh, not done great. But just building codes and energy efficiency requirements over time have really led us to creating more of an airtight home. And it's great uh, from an energy bill standpoint, but if we don't have the air quality dialed in inside, you can run into some, some pretty big catastrophes just with having the humidity so high indoors. So ideally, we want to keep that between like 35 to 50 for most times of the year. When it starts to get in the 50s, 60s, and you're having trouble controlling your humidity levels, that can be a signal that something is going on inside the home. Like if your humidity level is getting, and it shouldn't really matter much what the outdoor humidity level is if you have an airtight home, but if you're struggling in like the 60s and 70s, hey, that might be a signal that you might have a 
slow leak going on in inside. So airtight homes can be really great if we have great air. And you mentioned measuring this humidity. There's a really easy way to measure the humidity in your home, right? Yes, it's a hygrometer. You can get a little $5 thing off Amazon and just put them in each of the rooms, uh, maybe like above the light switch, and you'll be able to see like day in and day out. If it starts to keep creeping up and getting really high, that can be an indication that something's going on. Um, I didn't realize that to put them in each of the rooms. If you're putting them in each and every room and there's a leak in only one of the rooms, then it'll also help you pinpoint where your home is, quote, sick. Yeah, it, it can be a good indication. That's the key to like having a healthy home. If you can't renovate or do a new build or any of that, monitoring your home, having that empowerment to feel confident in checking, mm -hmm. right? So having a hygrometer, having maybe a moisture meter, if we take it below a window when it's raining, we'll be able to tell if the moisture is in the drywall is higher than it should be. Or if you have that feeling of like, I don't know, something is going on behind that wall. I feel like something's happening there. Take a moisture meter to it check. You don't have to start ripping your home apart to start investigating it. Is a moisture meter the same as a hygrometer? So the hygrometer is going to be measuring your relative humidity, mm -hmm. but the moisture meter is just like a little device you could get at a hardware store online, and it will measure the moisture level of that particular building material. So say drywall. You can use it for wood. And you can just point it at the wall. So they have ones that are pinless or maybe you've seen the ones with the two little pins mm -hmm. and you can poke it into some drywall you can do either and it'll just read the moisture content of that material is it a wise idea to do that on a rainy day for example so that you can see where there could be an area that's hmm. continuously getting wet when it's raining i love rainy days it's like weather testing your home. Get a moisture meter out. Start testing areas that, that you think might be having issues. Yeah, rainy days are, are great to really investigate your home. See what's happening when the rain is coming down your gutter. Is it just like pooling up around your foundation? Mm. Maybe you need a little extender to get it away. Walk us through this investigator's path, because I think most people listening are in this position of needing to be the maintainer, needing to have this heightened sense of awareness and just start paying attention to these things. But I'm sure people have no idea what to pay attention to. I sure don't. So if you could give us the full walkthrough, essentially, of everything we need to be an investigator. There's a long list. Let's go. Yeah, I'm just going to let you go <laughs> There's off. There's a long list. It's estimated that around 60 to 70 percent of contractor litigation is due to water damage. So it's not always just that you have this new construction home. You could have a really healthy home, but there's human error. Mm -hmm. Things happen. There could be a picture hung that goes through some of your plumbing. You just don't know. But we should know what's going on in our home. So some really simple things that you can even kind of retrofit or add to your existing home would be like a whole home leak detecting device. How great is that? We should know. A whole home leak detecting so device? So on your main water line that's coming in before it goes to the hot water and all of your fixtures, there's a device that you can attach to that and it will be reading the flow of your water and in some cases can detect up to one drop per minute of a leak. Wow. So simple to do. You do need a plumber to install that. But the peace of mind of knowing that you will be alerted if there is a leak in your plumbing line. Amazing. So something like that, it can really save not only cost-wise, right, a catastrophe, or if you're on vacation mm -hmm. and you come home to a leak. Um, now, some of these devices, I will say, do work off of Wi-Fi, just okay. in their nature. But oftentimes, your main plumbing is maybe in the garage or like not in a main living space. So maybe your comfort level is okay with that. But it's really nice to have for peace of mind, even if you just use it when you're away on vacation. But we have two things to really look for when it comes to leaks. That's our focus is water supply lines, but also our drain lines, that bathtub drain on the second level, what's going on with it, or that shower drain Toilets are notorious for leaking over time, right? They kind of settle and get a little wobbly. Having something as simple, like you mentioned, a second level bathroom, 
we should be having an access panel right below that toilet. It doesn't have to be hideous, but get a little 12 by 12 access panel to where you can just pop that down, check it out annually. Is your toilet leaking? And shut it back up. How would one install that access panel? It's just a, a hole in your drywall. <laughs> you could even, you could, they make plastic ones that you could just pop right in. Whoa. But I if had you're, no idea this existed. Yes. So you probably see them like on the backside of a bathtub sometimes or maybe in a garage. But really, they should be everywhere that plumbing is. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't just close it up with drywall and hope and pray that, that nothing happens for years to come. Because we want our home to withstand many, many years. And so having access to all of our plumbing just makes good sense. Mm -hmm for peace of mind. You could even put a little battery operated leak detector up there. Mm -hmm. So again, if, if your drain line is leaking, you would be notified of it. So I think those are always a smart idea to just have an access door anywhere that you have plumbing on the second level. Maybe you have a second level laundry room. How often do Washing machines overflow? Mine has overflowed twice in my townhouse. I had rented a townhouse before we bought the house, but it overflowed twice and it actually shorted the lighting mm -hmm. in the kitchen underneath it. That's how we knew it was leaking because the light went out. Right. But otherwise, how would we have known? Right. We don't want to get to the point where the light is, you know, notifying us. We could have these little leak, de little battery operated leak detectors there. Yeah. We just have so much plumbing going on in our modern homes these days. Yeah. That we should have eyes on all of this. <laughs> it used to be an outhouse, you know? Yeah. <laughs> that made more sense. I guess so. It simplifies things, but we love living with the convenience and the luxury of the multiple bathrooms and everything like that. So keep going. But I also want you to just throw in there what you said about knowing the plumbing and the drain lines of your home. Cause that's something I think we just never think maybe our husbands look at, I don't know, but maybe they don't. <laughs> so how do you find that out? And maybe we don't, right? We're, we're buying in most cases, somebody else's home. Yeah. Somebody else has lived in this home and they've done other renovations that we we don't know if they were up to par. We don't know what happened. So we don't always know the history of the home. You can use a thermal camera. They're pretty easy to use, um, but it it's another kind of tool in your toolbox of home maintenance, right? Having a, a thermal camera, having a moisture detecting device, Having these things just on hand are, are great tools to have. So you can do that. A plumber can can show you where your water and drain lines are. Wherever there's a bathroom on a second level, you're going to have plumbing uh, below that. It all goes back to either your hot water tank or your main water line of where your water source is. So maintaining those bathrooms and those laundry rooms are really key. And just like in your case, when that washing machine overflowed, what if it had a drip pan below it that was connected to a drain, right? Most laundry rooms back in the day had a drain in the middle of them, right? It's a wet room. It could get wet. Oh, you're saying, yeah, because, okay, yeah, in my childhood home where we rented upstairs, there was a set of laundry machines in the garage, and the garage had a drain in the ground. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess because it was an outdoor laundry room, essentially, there was also that added level of protection. Yeah, it, it's, they're often in the garage, depending on where you're located. Oftentimes, laundry's in the garage or somewhere where it can get wet. Mm -hmm. But now we've kind of steered away from that. And now we have these stackable washing machines in our hallway and there's carpet in front of it. So just getting back to the idea of treating wet rooms like they are wet rooms and having these safeguards in place because nobody wants to be ripping out drywall from an overflowing washing machine or maybe it goes undetected and that light never gave you that signal and Maybe there's mold growth there now. There probably is. Yeah. We, we were not able to open up the drywall and get in there to dry it. So yeah. in my home now, there's a basement laundry room, which is feeling to me like it's the very much wrong move because I can't get into that floor. Well, the basement's okay because it, it's a concrete slab. It's right? carpeted. It's a carpeted basement. It is a carpeted basement. It's an interesting mm, decision. We got to touch on basements. Cool. Love that. Right. Can we touch on basements and carpet? Great. Here's the thing with basements 
and I know people are not going to love that I say this, but basements should not be finished. They really, really shouldn't. For the most, I hear you. Most of the time, waterproofing of these walls, these concrete walls, it breaks down over time. And if you start to see water intrusion or evidence of something called efflorescence, which is like this kind of white, chalky, powdery look, that's evidence of water coming in through the walls. From where? From the exterior, from the soil. If you have a below grade basement and you can you can see the soil, the moisture coming in. So when you talk about what should we look for when it rains, <gasps> go check out that basement. I didn't yeah. think of that. I mean, like this is a wild concept that your basement is surrounded by earth and yes. wet soil and it rains and soil becomes wet many feet down. Oh, yeah. And then that moisture is lining your walls. And so you're saying if they were unfinished concrete walls, they're breathable? Well, it's this layer of, okay, if we suspect that our basement maybe didn't have the best waterproofing when it was built, or maybe we're in an older home and it's broken down over time, and we go and put drywall to close that up, where is that moisture going? Is it just going behind our drywall? Mm -hmm. And when we take down the drywall, is there now evidence of, of mold growth? Because if we're letting those walls just be what they were, breathing and bringing in moisture, then we're not trapping it with this insulation and drywall. And maybe we even have wallpaper up down there. When you say let the walls be what they were, what were they? Or like, what is the ideal wall? If the waterproofing is breaking down. So oh, if, oh, oh. We, if we're suspecting that water may be coming in through the basement walls or even just vapor from it, then it would be best to leave it unfinished because we need to have that waterproof barrier. So it's not bad to water because I'm a little confused because you were saying a finished, it shouldn't be finished. Finished so in finished basements will often have carpet or some flooring down. They'll have framing and drywall up around the walls and look like a finished space. Mm -hmm. And if our walls of the basement were not waterproofed correctly, which is allowing water coming in, it's going to get up against that drywall and maybe that carpet on the flooring or sometimes it's like a laminate flooring and it's just not great to have moisture sandwiched in between those materials with nowhere for it to go. And if someone does want to finish their basement, is there a proper way to waterproof? Because you were saying if it's done improperly? Yeah, which as you can imagine would be pretty difficult to then kind of retrofit your basement walls because it should be waterproof from the exterior. Oh, because then how are you going to get, you're going to what go right up against the soil and waterproof it and then put a wall? Well, <laughs> if the basement's already in place, right? We kind of have to wow. work with what we've got. So there are ways to, there's a kind of a dimple membrane that will allow the slab to breathe, right? The idea that it's breathing and wicking away moisture and we're not trapping it. Mm -hmm. um, that's a good idea f when it comes to wanting to put flooring down in your basement. But that's something that you put directly on the concrete. Yeah. Say it, what it is again. It's a dimple material that allows airflow. It's an underlayment specific for basement floors okay. that allow a, a ton of airflow and just for that slab to breathe. But if somebody is just looking for like the best solution, right? Creating kind of a healthy basement where they don't have to worry uh -huh. or watch it. I, I would just leave it unfinished. Leave the concrete. So same for the walls. Yeah. Leave the concrete walls. I'm about to go tear down my basement walls. <laughs> <laughs> we'll start with the moisture meter. Yes. yes. Start there because we also don't want to just kind of get in there and start like demoing because we don't know. Yes. What if there is something toxic behind the walls. We don't want to go in and do a demo of it. At that point, then it should be contained and remediated and going through the proper steps. So, okay. Testing. So all, all of our folks with unfinished basements out there where you were like, oh, I wish I could finish this now as part of my home. You're doing it right. Actually, <laughs> less is more. And I love that for you. Less is more. So I guess it's, I think of it now, I'm like, oh, a lot of basements are cold, but the fact that it's cold because it's not insulated is yeah. great. Because yeah. it's breathing. It's breathing. It's breathing. And yeah, that's just, that's my stance on it. I just kind of tend to go a little bit more like conservative. Sure, there's a ton of 
products and things that we can like start applying to the walls and trying to prevent the water from coming in. But in the end, if we just let it be what it is, an unfinished basement, maybe that's how it was designed and built 50 years ago. Because they were cellars right down there. It was kind of like you were storing your ferments and canned goods and wines and all of these things at a temperature that was more cohesive to the Earth's chill zone. <laughs> yeah, they weren't movie theaters and, yeah. and playrooms back in the day. So we got here from the conversation about laundry rooms used to have a drip. Yeah, the drain. Or like a container that caught yeah. Drips. Yeah. Right? So that that's a good solution now. And if our laundry room is not on the basement and it's <laughs> in the second floor or even first floor and you have a basement and can access it, you can put that drip pan, I think you said, underneath. And you can also put the leak meter battery powered. Yeah. Okay. You got this. Okay. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> yeah. So having, yeah, just safeguards. Wow. Like, because maybe you have like laminate or hardwood flooring in your laundry room. If if it's going to overflow, it's going to damage that flooring. So just have a leak pan and a leak detector, and then you hear that thing go off, and you're like, okay, we got we got an issue. Let's go let's go fix it. Mm -hmm. And then you can obviously have a plumber come and fix the leak if it's coming from the toilet. Yeah, you're getting it at the source, but at least you have the drip pan to catch the leak, or you can at least open up that panel where you're accessing the drip mm -hmm. pan to let it air out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Love so, that. And that really goes for like any appliance that has water. Mm. Our dishwasher. What's our dishwasher doing? Yeah. How often? Who's taking their dishwasher out to check to make sure those connections aren't leaking over time? Right. We, we just leave it there. So having something like another drip pan under our dishwasher, a leak detector in the back, then we can just kind of set it and forget it and be alerted. What if someone's living in an apartment or a condo where they're on, yeah, the second or third floor or whatever it is, but in order to install that drip pan or that access panel, you'd have to go into someone else's apartment. How then so do you So the deal? good thing about these drip pans is they slide underneath the appliance itself. So huh. you don't actually have to install anything per se. It, it's just a little pan the size of the appliance that has a lip on three sides and oh. you just slide that appliance in. Okay. So you're taking out, kind of put, placing it on top of this pan. So it's pretty much retrofitted almost sliding that back in its spot. And then, so if it were to leak, then would it kind of overflow in the drip pan and then you'd see the leak better or? Yeah. Ideally the combination would be like to have this leak pan and then the little leak detector, right? And those, where does the leak detector go? It could go in the back or somewhere in the pan, mm -hmm. right? So then in, it detects like one thirty second of an inch okay. of water. So okay. it's sup super sensitive. So you don't so. need to access. It's a bonus if you can access it and have yeah. an access panel so that you can let things air out if it does overflow and leak and get to the flooring. Yeah. I know a lot of folks are having mold symptoms or they're suspecting mold in their home or in their rental. And so I want to talk about what those folks can do to test their home for mold, as well as what those who are in the market for buying a home can do to test homes that they're viewing and thinking about putting an offer in on. Is ERMI or the ERMI the best way to do it? Do you need to go with a specialty company that really knows what they're doing or do all of them work? Give us the full breakdown on testing for mold. Once you start feeling that you are dealing with a mold situation and you have mold illness, you really do need to have a professional come in, not only for your health, but for your home. And that's not the situation where we want to start renovating or doing exploratory demo because that can really make matters worse. That's also a question is, should we test for mold regardless before we're about to demo a house? Oh, yeah. You, do, you don't want to start demoing something if you suspect that there could be mold present. Huh. Because we're not going to have containment up. We're not going to have an uh, air purifier, negative air machine running. Like sometimes you can start doing demo and you've just kind of opened up a can of worms and you didn't have, you know, your sofas in the middle of the living room and you have these items that now are somewhat contaminated because you've done this mm. demo. So if there's suspicion that there may be mold present and containment's always a good idea for demo because we just don't need that debris flying to other rooms. What is containment for those who don't know? Containment would be the plastic 
you, typically a good idea would be six millimeter plastic, mm -hmm. floor to ceiling, taped, and there's a zipper in the middle that really just contains the dust and debris as you're going through this. So if you're demoing one room, you're containing all of the doorways and windows within that room. Okay. Yeah. And we don't want to be kicking on our central heating and cooling, blowing all of that throughout the rest of our home. So keep your heat and cooling off while you're demoing, period. Yeah. I never even thought of that. What a good tip. Okay. Yeah. And construction in, in general. If you're doing construction, they should really not be using that central heating and cooling the lungs of your home because we just don't want that debris in that duct work. So if there's suspicion that there could be mold within your home, yes, bring in a professional. The ERMI test is a really great test to do. And an ERMI test is essentially testing dust. It's testing the history, right? As dust accumulates at the, at the top of a surface, it's going to test over time. So kind of give you a a story over time of what's going on, they can be pretty alarming because they give you like a red number or they give you this score. Sometimes testing on your own can be problematic because then you have this test. Well, what do I do with this test? It has this red number. What do I do next? So having somebody come in that's going to do multiple tests because it's not just about the dust, air cavity samples, right? Because if we get this score back from dust, well, 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 where is it? Where's the mold? Where do I need to focus my attention? So doing a combination of testing with a professional, like an ERMI test, air cavity samples, sometimes air samples can, can be helpful, but they're not always telling. So having enough of the, the pieces of the puzzle to put together, and then from there, working with a remediator to, to correct the issue. Are there holistic remedi remediators just like there are holistic general contractors? <laughs> Remediation is a tricky, tricky thing to navigate because it's wildly expensive uh -huh. to remediate. Mm -hmm. And where I have concern is when the inspection company is the remediation company also. Mm. To me, that is a conflict of interest. So really having parties separate because they might give you a false positive to get you to pay for the remediation, or there's a chance for that. Or what if they come in and they remediate because you should be having post-remediation testing, right? That's like, green light, we're all clear. What if that is skewed a bit? So I just think that it can be problematic. It's, of course, not always, but having an advocate for you that's independent is a good idea. And yeah, going through that remediation process that's not going to contaminate the rest of your home. Then when it comes to those tests that you mentioned, the ERMI, as well as other tests like the air duct or air cavity testing, mm -hmm. can the same mold testing professional perform all of those tests? Do they all know to perform them? Do you have to ask for them specifically? Is there also a caliber of mold testing company that we should be looking for? You always want to get three opinions. Okay. Even with construction, right? Yeah. When you go through this renovation, you'll likely get a price and a bid from three contractors to really see what are they offering. Yeah, so That's a good standard of practice for anything that you're going to have done to your home. Get three bids. Get okay. three three opinions. Uh, there are certifications that, that they can have and just see what their warranty is. What are they guaranteeing? Are they going to guarantee a clean test? But yeah, having somebody that is going to be on your side. Now, I want to go back to what you said about the heating and cooling system because I wanted you to really expand there. Why can the central heating and cooling system be so much of an issue? I know that you mentioned the filters not being changed by previous tenants in an apartment, but in a home, is central heating and cooling bad period or no okay so central heating and cooling is is great for our comfort level and to maintain the the interior temperature of our home but it can be problematic because it is the lungs of our home so if that second level bathroom has a mold issue it's not isolated to that bathroom got it the air within that space is is not contained it is throughout our home so that's just one layer to where yeah the ductwork can then have particles and, and mold spores and 
create more of an issue. Is there remediation that needs to be done to then remove those mold spores from the heating and cooling if mold, if mold is present? Yeah, in some cases, it would need to be entirely replaced because if you've ever seen ductwork in a home, it kind of looks like this slinky foil wrapped material with about a thousand different crevices, mm -hmm. right? And how are you going to get everything out of all of those crevices? There are air duct cleaning companies, but they're not always guaranteeing that everything is going is to get out. Is that why the air duct tests are important for the mold? Because if there is mold present in the house, you're more likely to find it in the air duct and then be able to work backwards and find the source. Right. Because we don't want to go through this remediation process and say, OK, we are good. Green light. And then we go and turn turn on our central heating and cooling. And it's like, oh, I can't figure out why am I still feeling ill? Like I did the remediation. Maybe it's something within the lungs of your home that is constantly blowing out and circulating in your home. So it is always a good idea to have maintenance from a professional on your heating and cooling system. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of this, to your point initially, really involves prevention and maintenance of your home. Obviously, yes, it's going to take, if, if you feel that your home has these points of possible sickness, and if you're having symptoms or if you feel like there's parts of your home that could be healthier, it's good to test and start to investigate and get to the bottom of it. But a lot of people can probably just start here and now with the maintenance, so at least they're maintaining anything getting worse or preventing anything from getting worse. Yeah. Yes. I, and really take a look at how are how are you feeling in your home? Do you wake up puffy and swollen? Are you feeling congested? Are you having some of those mold illness symptoms within your home? And then that may be a cause to start at least testing, being aware, having a baseline of, of what's going on in your home. And then that's when you can kind of start implementing some of these measures. But yeah, maintenance, anybody could start doing maintenance, you know, today to, to start at least preventing any failures in the future. What about while a home is under construction and you have everything sort of open and they have the tarp and whatnot covering parts of the home, but then it rains and you don't know if water gets in. I mean, you can't stop the rain and when a home is being actively built or renovated. So what do you do there? They used to not build homes in the winter. In the winter. But in, the, yeah. in New York, even it rains even in the summer. Yeah. So it, we can't prevent it all. Ideally, if, if someone was to be doing a build or a renovation, they would kind of plan accordingly. Let's do it in these months, maybe when it's not heavy rain season. But we can't always prevent it from getting wet, but we can dry it out. Okay. Just dry it out. The problem with lumber, again, is sometimes you'll see homes built and the lumber that's installed already has mold growth on it. Like it arrives like that. So we really want to try and prevent that and just have eyes on everything from the beginning and preventing even that from being installed in the beginning. So drying it out, doing the best that we can and not having fear around building and renovating. So if someone has a, a home that is, let's say, 100 years old, because you kept saying 100 years was sort of this magic number, it was things were done quite well, the wood was better quality, how can one do a renovation and maybe do an extension or expand or move things around while making the best use out of that old lumber? Should you literally take some of the old lumber from where you're demoing and use it somewhere else and preserve it? How do you prevent bringing in as many new materials and weak lumber as possible when you're adding to an old home? Great question. And a lot of people do renovate these older homes. And I would say like 50, 1950s, 60s, 70s, those are all still good homes. Now, the lumber was really good. From a structural standpoint, they were awful, right? You could, mm -hmm. the structural standards were really poor back then. So the lumber is really good. But we do want to bring that home up to code from a safety standpoint. So I, I wouldn't recommend reusing existing lumber. And building materials today aren't awful. If we can get good, clean, dry, quality building materials, we can create a healthy home. How do we vet those? How do we know what to look for? We have to ask 
and specify, right? If we're going to be doing an addition on our home and we're going to be getting new lumber, we want to be communicating that to the contractor mm. that any moldy lumber is to be rejected, is to not will be they installed. See moldy lumber? They sh yes, they're aware. Now they will tell you, this is lumber yard mold. What is that? How is that? <laughs> how is that different than than mold? No. So in some cases, you may need to be there and sort through it or reject it or it's going to depend on your contractors level of willingness but involvement is going to be huge when wow. when you're doing things like this because again we all have different interpretations of a healthy home mm -hmm. so specifying that so when it comes to lumber there's something called kd lumber or kill and dried where it's actually dried whereas green lumber is cut wet stored wet delivered wet and whoa installed wet and and they're very different so if you're looking for, you know, a phrase that you can kind of share is that you would like to have kill and dried or KD lumber and have it delivered dry and covered. What else we need to be communicating with our contractor about explicitly in this sense? It's going to require a lot of involvement, a lot of communicating what you want that materials are to be stored, covered, right? Especially during rainy season. Do not deliver the drywall and leave it outside in the mud for rain. Like we need to be storing it above, you know, raised above the ground on some two by fours, covered with a tarp in a garage or covered area and communicating that materials are to be dry. And I really like the idea of having a mold inspection prior to drywall being installed in a new construction home. So inspecting the drywall that was delivered before it goes up? Inspecting the framing, because once you put up drywall in a new construction home, that kind Seals. of buttons it up. Mm. So getting those green lights along the way are, are going to really give you that peace of mind that you know that things are clean, things are dry. Let's get the green light to put drywall up and proceed with the project. Mm -hmm. So having these these extra steps in place. And lastly, when it comes to choosing our contractor, because obviously you are a holistic licensed general contractor, but you're quite rare. So what kind of questions can we use in our interviewing and vetting process when we're talking to different contractors who are bidding on our home? Uh, what do we need to look out for? How do we find someone like you? A great way to kind of see how that contractor works is ask can I go walk one of your projects? Do you have a project under construction? Can I go see it? See what that's like. Is it a mess? Are there like beer cans all over the place? Are they, you know, not taking really good care of that project and, and keeping things clean? That's one way, but really just talking to them about how do you store materials? How do you order materials? What, what do you do to make sure that materials are clean when they're installed? Having that conversation with them and it doesn't take a holistic contractor it takes a willing contractor to be on the same page to be meticulous and to know that your number one concern is dry everything and yeah. storage and all of these things yeah okay and you have a checklist right of what to ask your contractor on your site i do yeah i have a checklist okay. yeah so they you can download that that's a, a simple way to just kind of start the conversation mm -hmm. of how to kind of interview and vet a contractor and you get a feeling if, if they're on the same page as you, but it's, yeah, you, you gotta be, gotta be involved. An actual last question is, I know that we just touched on the access panels, the leak meters, the drip pans, but anything else that we specifically need to start doing today for that maintenance? Just walk around the outside of your home. Do you have sprinklers that are spraying up daily along the side of your home? You know, what can you do from the outside? Because that's really our jacket, right? We have the roof, our hat, that's jacket. That's what's really going to help prevent the water from coming in. That's where we, we want to focus first. If we can keep the water from coming in, that's a great, great thing. So really checking the exterior of your home and your windows, doing that maintenance, you know, a couple of times a year, making sure that water is not coming in. That's a great way to stop the the root of it sometimes. And using your rainy days as walkthrough days, as the days that you're looking at all of these things. Yeah. Especially heavy rain days. Yeah. Okay. Amazing. Thank you so much. I think that this conversation is going to really spark that awareness in people and hopefully make them more passionate about that 
ownership that we need to take in our homes, looking at the the floor plans or the blueprint or whatever has the plumbing and the draining structures and just starting to do more of those walkthroughs and maintenance and installing those simple things like the dry pans and the incandescent lamps. It's Those are just such tangible, easy things to do. And I think will make a huge difference. So if you could just please tell us where we can find you and look at more of your work. Oh, yeah. So Instagram, that's where I am most of the time at Holistic Homes by Christine. We will have a podcast this fall, Holistic Homes podcast. And I'm, yeah, mostly on on social media. That's where you can find me. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great.